Excellent. Right. We'll go just on route. So we'll go another 30 seconds, 60 seconds odds, and then we'll just get uh, cracking. Hopefully everyone can see my slides okay as well. Monthly breakfast beating to pay. Any thumbs up, hopefully, or the like. Not yet. Do can you see the slides? Not yeah. yet, no. No, that's not ideal. Let's start again. So yeah, I can see the slides. Oh, they've see gone. The slide. Right, I've gone now, sorry. So let me just get them back up again. So when in doubt, everything goes wrong. How's that? Yep. You will see slides now? Good. Let's see if anyone's else still in the waiting room. I can't see them. Let's do a quick straw poll. Who, who can see the, the slides? Monthly breakfast briefing? Yeah. What? Yeah, I can see them, Kevin. Yeah, you can. So I think most people can see them. What to do? I'll, I'll crack on just now. Uh, and if the slides and the recording of this will be sent out, a link to the recording will be sent out later on. So even if you're even struggling to see the slides, you will be able to see them uh, afterwards. Okay, good morning. There we are. My name's Kevin Duffy. I'm one of the solicitors with the Scottish Engineering Legal and HR team. And this is the November breakfast briefing on the riveting topic, topic of TUPI, uh, which is the transfer of undertakings, uh, potential employment regulations 2006. So we'll take you through with the first substantive slides. So to pay or not to pay, that is the question. OK, so we're going to be discussing that today. And I've just cracked an absolutely hilarious employment law and classical Shakespeare joke and not one of you has cracked a smile. Right, so you're not going to get that very often on a Wednesday morning. So clearly you're a bunch of Philistines. So we shall just crack on. Right, so what is to pay? So as I mentioned earlier on, we're talking about the transfer of undertaking protection on employment regulations 2006. So invariably that is known as the to pay regulations. Enacted into UK law in 2006 to comply with EU law when we were still members of the EU. And the 2006 regs themselves updated the previous 1981 2P regs. And these 1981 regs themselves implemented the, the original European 2P directive for 1977. Now, there are two main objectives of 2P. Okay? Employees, along with their terms and conditions, transfer from the old employer to the new employer. This is where there is a relevant transfer, and I'll discuss that two-word phrase, relevant transfer, uh, in more detail shortly. And part B, okay, second bullet point is old and new employers inform and consult with their employee reps about the transfer. Now, as in so many areas of employment law, the courts and tribunals expect employers to, to communicate with their staff so that nothing should come as a surprise to them. This is known as information and consultation, and I'll also discuss this in a bit more detail later. So the agenda for today. So when does TUPE apply? Okay. First one is a uh, discussing the terminology. Sorry. As with any area of the law, there are some specific words and phrases that are used regularly in the TUPE environment. And I'll introduce you to a few of these main ones. So when does TUPE apply? As I said, what are the factors to look for in a business perspective? Okay. Who transfers? So who does TUPE apply to and who does it not apply to? and to pay protections for employees, very important for employers. The underlying ethos of TUPE is that employees transfer over with their terms and conditions intact, as I mentioned earlier on. Now, there are routes for redress and potential sanctions for errant employers who don't follow the TUPE rules. Information and consultation. As per my last slide, nothing should come as a surprise to the employees before or after the transfer. And the final point is some practical points on how to deal with a 2P situation from a business perspective. So terminology, transferor is the old employer. As the name perhaps suggests, this is the employer that currently employs the employees prior to the transfer. The transferee is a new employer, and as you can probably guess, this is the new employer who takes on the employees under terms and conditions after the transfer. Employee 
Now, it has to be just that. It has to be an employee under a contract of employment. It can't be, for example, a self-employed contractor. Now, relevant transfer, as we mentioned earlier on, business transfer or service provision change. I'll go into them in a bit more detail right now. Those are the two areas where to pay applies. So, as I said earlier on, a business transfer, and I apologise in advance, some of the things I'll be saying are relatively wordy because the 2P regulations can be quite detailed in their actual uh, wording themselves. <coughs> so apologies for the convoluted wording. So transfer of a business undertaking or part of a business or undertaking where there is a transfer of an economic entity that retains its identity. So there are three essential elements in, in that definition. Number one, economic entity. Number two, a transfer of that in economic entity. And number three, has to retain its identity following the transfer. And as you can see in most of the slides as well, I've actually put in live hyperlinks to the particular reg regulations if you want to go and read those regulations themselves, should you so wish. So to unpick this a wee bit here, undertaking, right? That is basically a fancy word for some sort of entity or body corporate in the legal world. As you can see, it doesn't have to be a whole business or undertaking that transfers. It can be one part, say a particular department of a business. Now, it has to be an economic entity i.e. an organised and stable grouping of resources with the objective of pursuing an economic activity. So factors like management structure, how the teams and groups are organised, and operating methods are all relevant here to determine whether it is an economic entity or not. Now, that economic entity has to transfer. To put another way, the identity of the employee, so employer, must change. So, for example, a share sale won't activate to pay. The, because the employees are still owned by X limited company. It's just that the shareholders, the owners of X limited company have changed. Now, the economic entity itself must retain its identity. So was the business a part business sold as a going concern? And I'll use that phrase quite a lot, a going concern. Does it carry out its activities in much the same way before the transfer and after the alleged transfer? For example, did customers transfer over as well? Those are all indicative of economic activity and retaining its identity. Now, all of the above matters are all very fact specific. Somebody in the waiting room. Very fact specific, and any court will have to have an in depth look at the specifics of any given situation. One second, move on to the next slide. So, second situation where 2P applies, okay, and that is a service provision change. Now, this is where the client engages a contractor to do work on its behalf, reassigns such a contract, or brings the work in-house, okay? Three separate uh, situations there, outsourcing, re-outsourcing, or insourcing. Now, hopefully these terms are all relatively self-explanatory. So, but a common SPC, a common service provision change, are things like cleaning or security services. A company has, for example, their own in-house cleaner, but then wants an external contractor to do the cleaning. That would be outsourcing. Or if you move your cleaning contract from one outsource contractor to another outsource contractor, that is re-outsourcing. Or if you get rid of your outsource contractor, bring the work back in-house, that's obviously insourcing. So those, I hope, are all relatively self-explanatory. Now, for an SPC, for a service provision to change, the activities must be fundamentally or essentially the same. So to continue the analogy, the transferor, i.e. the old employer, needs to be carrying out cleaning activities, and the transferee, the new employer, needs to be also carrying out cleaning activities in much the same way, in fundamentally, essentially the same manner. Now, it cannot be for the supply of goods or a one-off buying of services. These are excluded. And again, hopefully you can see this. 2P is for ongoing, uh, going concern type situations. And the last exclusion is it's not for a single specific event, but a task of short-term duration. So again, these things, single specific event, task, short-term duration, are not indicative of the ongoing concern situation that 2P is generally uh, required to look at. So, two transfers. So firstly, it's any employees who haven't objected to the transfer because they're deemed to have resigned from the overall situation. It's not a dismissal, it's a resignation on their behalf. 
Now, and as I've mentioned above, employees employed by the transfer or and assigned to the organised grouping of resources or employees that are subject to the relevant transfer. They transfer, quite obviously, I would say. Now, the next bullet point, and again, apologies for the kind of lengthy definition, it applies to all employees who were employed in the grouping immediately before the transfer or who would have been so employed if they had not been dismissed by reason of the transfer, unless that reason was for an economic organisational reason, technical organisational reason, an ETO reason, changing changes in the workplace. Uh, now, number of things in that very, very wordy definition. Number one, it includes all employees employed before the transfer. Number two, and those employees dismissed prior to the transfers, but not dismissed for that ETO reason. So again, I'll break that down into hopefully a bit more plain English. Number one, the employees who are employed prior to the transfer, hopefully that's quite self-explanatory. Those are who are employed in the organised group of employees, they transfer over. Now it's a second one that's a bit more perhaps difficult in concept. Those employees who had been dismissed immediately prior to the transfer may transfer over as well. Now this refers to the situation where, for example, the transfer or business tries to make the company a bit more attractive to a potential buyer and it dismisses a number of its staff when it really didn't have the means or the, the reason to do so. If it's not for an ETO reason, which we'll discuss in a second, then those people will deem to have transferred as well because they've been unfairly dismissed beforehand. And also, you'll often find that a prospective buyer will put some pressure on the transferor to get rid of some dead wood, for want of a better term. And again, if those people are dismissed incorrectly, then they will have been deemed to transfer as well. And that comes into some of the redresses and uh, sanctions that I discussed earlier on, and we'll go into a bit more detail later as well. Now, unless one of these these dismissals are for an ETO reason, then, as I say, it's going to be automatically unfair. And all of this is known as the automatic transfer principle, where transfer or has employees, there is a transfer date, and they transfer over to the transfer E. Now, I've mentioned the ETO reason a couple of times, economic, technical, or organisational reason. Now, there's no statutory definition of this and it's understood by the courts and tribunals that it's meant to be looking at the day-to-day -day running of the business. So an ETO reason is likely to include things like a, a reason relating to the profitability or market performance of the transferee's business, i.e. the economic aspect. Now, this again relates to the going concern nature of the 2P transaction, and it can't be, as I've said above, just dismissing folk to make the business more attractive in the short term for prospective buyers. B, the reason relating to the nature of the equipment or production processes which the transferee operates, i.e. a technical reason. Now, for example, this is where the transferee installs new machinery that the transferor's previous staff don't have the skills to use. Or C, a reason relating to the management or organisation structure of the transferee's business, i.e. an organisational reason. An example of this is where a senior manager is no longer needed when a business is bought over because the transferee already has somebody in that particular place. Now, a couple of further points. For an ETO reason to even get off the ground in the first instance, it must entail, entail sorry, changes in the workplace. I, in areas like number of staff, their job function, or the place where they're so employed. Now, what I'll put there at the bottom right hand side is the link to the 2P guidance on the government's Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the BEIS guidance as well. And moving on to the next slide, I'm just going to elaborate a bit more on this as well. Now, <clears throat> one of the things I mentioned earlier on, dismissals will be automatically unfair if the sole or principal reason for the dismissal is the transfer itself, unless an ETO reason changing, sorry, entailing changes in the workforce is involved. Now, even if you have an ETO reason, the transferee still has to show general reasonableness or unfairness. So to put it another way, even if you can successfully argue an ETO reason in the first instance, it doesn't necessarily make the dismissal fair. All it does is make the dismissal not automatically unfair. You still need to have to prove general fairness. So things like proper process, consultation, having meetings, taking minutes, the right of appeal, et cetera, et cetera. 
Now, one of the other protections involved with Tupi, I always have a quick drink, is the protection against changes in terms and conditions. Okay. Changes to the terms and conditions of employment will be void if the sole or principal reason for the change is the transfer itself. Okay. Unless either A, the reason for the variation is an ETO reason entailing changes in the workforce, as I'm going on of a mantra, and the terms of the contract permits the employer to make that particular variation. Now, again, unpicking that, what does that mean? Firstly, if you're changing terms and conditions by dint of the transfer itself, the change is not legally competent and it has no legal effect. This is usually the case when the transferee tries to harmonise the terms and conditions of transferred in staff with its incumbent staff. Now, perhaps naturally you don't want to have two separate tiers of employees, but you've got to go around that very, very carefully. Indeed, if you just want to harmonise staff, transferred staff and incumbent staff purely by reason of the transfer, then you're you're onto a very legally shaky ground, unfortunately. Now, and as per that second point, this is a, a general rule of contract changes, and this applies in this situation as well, i.e. one party to a bilaterally agreed employment contract cannot make unilateral changes to that contract. If the employer tries that by, say, changing hours, changing location, changing pay, most certainly, then it's leaving itself open to the employees resigning and claiming constructive unfair dismissal, which again is a claim you perhaps don't want to try and have to face. However, moving on to the next slide, when it comes to changing terms and conditions, some of the two pay protections when it's an insolvent business are removed. Now, this is to try and uh, make a prospective company more attractive to a buyer if it's in an insolvency situation. The textbooks in the cases refer to what's known as a rescue culture, whereby an insolvency practitioner tries to sell off a business or part of the business as a going concern, thus hopefully saving some of the jobs as opposed to winding up the whole business and with everybody losing their job as well. Now, importantly, it has to be an insolvency practitioner and there are various different levels of insolvency procedure as well. This is a particularly thorny area of Tupi law, and I would most certainly advise you to take legal advice from us if you're in that particular situation. Now, I mentioned earlier on information and consultation. This is key, it's very, very important. So this is where the transferor and the transferee must inform and if appropriate, consult with the recognized trade union or elected employee reps if there isn't a trade union. Regarding employees who may be affected by the transfer or any measures taken in connection with it. Now, to go into a bit more detail with that, both the transferor and the transferee must inform and consult with the recognised trade union reps, okay? Certain information must be provided to the reps long enough before the transfer to enable the transferor to consult with them in sufficient detail. Now, although there will be a duty to inform on every 2 transfer, the duty can to consult which is slightly different, arises only when an employee envisages taking measures in respect of affected employees. That's in Regulation 13, the link at the bottom right. Okay, now there can be a bit of a fine distinction sometimes. It's often better to be seen both informing and consulting with the transferring staff as a failure to comply with these obligations exposes the parties to compensation of up to 13 weeks uncapped pay. Now, with large to pay transfers, 13 weeks multiplied by 50 staff, 100 staff, 1,000 staff, that can be particularly expensive for an errant employer. Okay, one little minor, minor point. Since 2014, any micro businesses with fewer than 10 employees can inform and consult directly with the employees and don't have to elect reps. Now, one major aspect of the obligations on the transfer or especially is employee liability information, ELI, as it's invariably known as. Now, as it says on the slide there, transferor must provide transferee with certain information about transferring employees not less than 28 days before the relevant transfer takes place. Okay, so this includes items like age of the employees, their statement of employment particulars, i.e. their contract, information regarding disciplinaries and grievances and many other aspects as well about basically the employee's life with the transferor. 
And this is to facilitate as smooth a transfer as possible from employer A to employer B, transfer or to transfer E. If the transfer or fails to provide this information, then the transfer E can play a claim, claim in the employment tribunal against the transfer or. And if the transfer or transfer E wins, it can get a payment of a minimum of five hundred pounds per employee where the ELI was not provided. So again, a further area where it can be particularly expensive for the parties involved. So just in summary, before I take some questions from the assorted people here, 2 pay is not optional. If the facts and circumstances activate the law, then 2 pay is activated, end of story. Companies have tried many times over the years to have complex routes to avoid 2 pay, they've got limited success. The reason for that is courts and tribunals take what's known as a purposive approach, i.e. they often search for a way to protect the employee as that was the underlying purpose of the regulations in the first place, hence the purpose of approach. Now, don't forget to inform and consult because that can be a costly error. Now, indemnities, that's often a very, very good way of the parties protecting themselves, especially the transferee in this, this situation. So often the transferee, the new employer, will seek out some sort of indemnity from the transferor to protect them from anything that perhaps crawls out of the woodwork within X months or years after the transfer. And now, most certainly, if you're in a 2 p situation, whether you are the transfer or, or the transferee, or you even think there might be, because very often you will have disputed 2 pays where one party says, they're not transferring over, we're not taking them, or you're not having them, things like that. Call Scottish Engineering for legal advice, because myself and the rest of my HR and legal college will be more than delighted to advise you on that. So that was a whirlwind tour of a very complex topic known as 2 pay. You can stick questions in the chat, either to everybody or to me anonymously, I won't mention who you are, and I'm happy to take verbal questions from the participants just now. So folks, over to you. Not much. Hi, Hi Kevin, it's Jan from Dover Decision. Hello, Jan. Hello. Kevin, can I ask a question? Um, you mentioned that organisational reason can Aye. be a reason to potentially dismiss an employee you know, who's going to transfer. So I guess if you were going through that process and you've identified that that role exists in the, the you know, transferring company yep. and the, the transferee, <clears throat> I guess you would still have to follow a fair redundancy process and do a selection criteria to... Yes, yes. And again, that, that, that's, that's often a point of conflict, internal conflict within a transferee uh, uh -huh. organisation. Because they've transferred in uh, a whole load of, I don't know, CNC machinists, drivers, secretaries, whatever. And then they find that they're overstaffed in that particular type of work. Yep. So their initial thought is, well, I'm just going to make those people redundant when we transfer them. Transfer. Mm -hmm. But that's not really the case. These people are transferred in with their full terms and conditions and the length of service. It's almost as if the transferee steps into the shoes of the old employer, the old transfer or employer. So sure. you have the same legal weight, the same standing as your long-serving uh, non-transferred staff as well. So yep. you would have to, uh, in that particular situation, yes, you would probably have to widen the pool out to everyone who does that particular type of work, whether they are long-serving Dover staff or long-serving people who have just transferred into Dover as well. Okay, perfect. So you couldn't just okay. automatically keep your own staff. You, you still would do that selection criteria. Right. right. So... Yeah, indeed, you would have to have some sort of selection criteria as well. Because as I mentioned earlier on, having the ETO reason just gets you over the initial hurdle of it's not automatically unfair. You need mm -hmm. to comply with the general fairness rules of consultation, meetings, right or appeal, yeah. sort of stuff. Okay, thanks for confirming that. No worries, Jan. Right, so we've got a chat question here from Jackie. If you've got four staff who will need to be transferring group, do you need to have a formal election process or can you have four reps? I mean, certainly for four staff who are going to be transferring in, uh, you wouldn't need to have four reps for all of them. Uh, you would certainly the include the election of the reps uh, invariably is an obligation for the transfer, or you would you would want to be involved as a transferee as well. But for four staff, you give them the opportunity to elect reps. Most certainly, usually for such a small amount of people, they would be happy just to be uh, informed and consulted with as well. But make sure there's the documentary audit trail to show that you at least gave them the opportunity to elect representatives as well. 
and then you've got it in the minutes going, we don't need a rep for four of us, just chat to us all. And I think that would minimise the risk in that particular situation. Hopefully that helps, Jackie. Okay. I'm happy to stay on for as long as is possible or as necessary. Any further questions? No, I think I've stunned you all into silence. So what I'll do just now is I'll stop the recording, I'll let everyone go on for the day, and I'll make sure the link is downloaded, and along with uh, the slide pack, it's PowerPoint slides, will be sent out to everybody as well. And unless we get any further questions, I shall bid you good morning. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Bye. Thank Cheers, you. Thank Take you. care. Evan, I've got a question. Oh, yeah. Who's that? Wait, 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 wait. It's Jackie from Inclusion. Jackie. Happy what if someone works... In the part of the business that's being transferred, i.e. one contract, Aye. but they also work in another part of the business that's not, is it only the bit of their contract that is being transferred? Or like, so, so we have a member of staff who works a 28 hours, but 21 hours are in the transferring bit, yeah. and seven hours are in the bit that's not transferring. Is it a 20 hour contract that transfers? Well, the, 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 initial, the initial question would be whether they're transferring at all, because if they have a many, many, a number of different duties, a, and only one aspect of that duty is it's whether they're wholly or mainly assigned to that particular question, is wholly or mainly assigned to that organized grouping. So the question is perhaps in that particular situation, when they're doing 20 odd hours and they're only doing a wee minor amount on another contract. Uh, it may well be that they transfer over in its entirety and you've got to find somebody to cover those hours in the little bit that they've left. So again, very fact specific. I'm, I mean, I'm happy to pick up with you specifically on that one, Jackie. Because what, what you'll often find is that, say a, de a department or a group of employees, they have, uh, they service one particular client that does maybe 80 or 90% of their work. Then that client moves their work to another organisation. So that would be perhaps... Uh, the the outsourcing that I mentioned earlier on, but that group of people did ten percent of their work for a whole number of other uh, clients as well. In that situation, where they seem to be wholly or mainly assigned to that one transferring employer, yeah, I think they would uh, transfer over, and then the old employer would ne merely need to find other ways to service the ten percent of people who's now unserviced by that group, having left. No, that makes sense. That's perfect. So it becomes a question of fact and degree as well. Are they wholly or mainly assigned? Are they doing 80% or 90% or is it 70%? And I hasten to add, it's not just a, a mathematical, arithmetical exercise. They'll look at the, the depth and scope of the information of the uh, work as well. It's not just a case of they do 25 hours there and five hours there, because there have been some cases in kind of bizarre circumstances where somebody has given the majority of their time to a particular client, but they were then was then found not to have uh, transferred over because, for example, the time that they did uh, allocate to that particular client was actually relatively uh, low-level work, whereas they put more higher-level intellectual work into a smaller amount of hours. Do you see where I'm coming from? It, yeah, no, that makes sense. Which is a bit of a get-out. Thank you. Okay, no worries, Jackie. Now, I'm happy to stay on all morning to wax on about Trippy. So if anyone has any further questions, happy to take them verbally just now. Kevin, I've got a confusing one to a certain extent for us, is that we've got one department that is moving to one of our other companies. Right. Um, so there's about, just about less than 10 employees transferring right. across. Um, and it's just to kind of understand in terms of kind of contractual terms, one company pays on, say, the 23rd, the other one pays on, say, the 25th. Right. Will that be an issue? And in terms of pension, could we stay in the existing pension with our company or would we have to set up a new pension scheme with the other company because the other company doesn't pay the same pension terms? So right. it's just trying to juggle it all, really. I'll, I'll give you a, a brief overview just now, and I think possibly we should talk about that in a bit more uh, specific, specifics offline. Yeah. Julian, uh, I'm thinking to just now. Yep, it is, sorry. Yeah, just, uh, so where we are, uh, right, first off, for the change in payment date, is that written into their contract of employment? Yes. 
Right, and does does the contract have any contract variation clause in there that says we can make reasonable terms and changes to your terms and conditions? Blah, blah, blah. Um, yes, yes. It does, right. So it then becomes a question of whether the payment date, changing the payment date is going to be a fundamental change or just a minor change. Mm -hmm. and so long, for something like that, so long as you give the employees sufficient notice to say we're changing it from that date to that date, then I would suggest that you may get away with that as a, as a contract change under the inherent power that you've got in the contract to make minor changes. Yeah. Again, you would have to make sure that you pick up with your members or staff to find out that that's not going to cause them any issues with uh, any other direct debits or standing orders or mortgage payments or etc. Because if somebody has got their uh, finances down to a, a very fine razor edge and all of a sudden changing it two days means they go into overdraft, then you may get uh, problems with that. With that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And on the, the pension front, pensions are not specifically covered by 2P, but there are other regulations that more or less have the same uh, uh, the same uh, effect of transferring over. First off, I would advise you to talk to the pensions provider as well, because as, uh, do you have a separate pensions organisation, like Scottish Widows or whatever, who assists you on this? Um, we've got a broker, so we use a bro pension yeah. broker, yeah. and then we've got two different pension schemes for, for these two different companies. Yeah. Yeah, so basically the pension, the pension terms and conditions themselves don't necessarily transfer over. You would hopefully try to get them something of, of not less favourable terms and conditions as well. And the broker should be able to talk you through on that. And again, so there is, there is, there is the argument that yes, they would have to transfer over, but not necessarily on their, the same terms and conditions regarding pensions. I think what we'll do is, could you send me the, the details of that in an email, Gillian, sure. with you specifically? I'm out of the office today, unfortunately, but I'll be able to pick up you maybe tomorrow. Yeah, and that's no problem. We're not. I mean, we're only kind of starting the process, and we're right. looking at probably about May next year before it oh, actually yeah. kind of goes through. Well, that that's good because many employers usually give me a call at the day before the transfer. So <laughs> if you've given me seven <laughs> months' notice, we can work something out. Super, brilliant. Thanks, Kevin. Okay, no worries. Anybody else for any more? No, that was good, folks. Right, so definitely on this one. I'm going to let you go and enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, Kevin. Bye-bye. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you. Bye-bye.